As you might imagine, I've spent this week digging into Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10, from every angle that I could possibly imagine, dissecting, researching, reviewing, re-researching. But I must tell you that hearing it read once again this morning, as Ralph did so wonderfully, it was like hearing it again for the first time. This, this particular passage of Scripture, for me anyway, is some of the most consequential, wonderful, exciting, motivating, and downright encouraging words that have ever been written in my humble perspective. You've all heard the term genetic engineering. We think we're smart because we can manipulate genes. Well, I'm here to tell you that something far more wonderful than genetic engineering happened and has been happening since literally creation itself. This is a pressing issue for Christians. You won't find the media or academia or Hollywood elites, even most Christian publications, talking about this consequential issue. Now, I will submit that there is one particular book recently written that does address this issue. It's called Functioning as Designed, Being the Beings the Creator Designed Us to Be. And yes, this is a shameless plug for my book. It can be found on the Grow Desk if you have yet to take a copy, but be warned, today I'm giving it away for free. Hereafter, the price doubles. <laughs> I should also point out that uh, I actually wrote the book in, in uh, 2021, I think, and there actually is a theological carelessness if you will, on page 70. So some of you who are theologically astute, if you get to page 70 and still haven't used it to start your fire, then you will find a, a theological carelessness on that page. The issue, some of you may have guessed by now, that we'll be discussing today is poetic engineering far more consequential than genetic engineering or any other engineering that we can imagine. I would submit that understanding the ramifications of poetic engineering is life-altering. The issue must be confronted personally. Failure to do so is not an option. Once you come to grips with the reality of the consequences of poetic engineering, the way that you see the world, the way that you see other people, indeed the very way that you see yourself, can never be the same. You'll find yourself, as I have often done, asking questions like, so what comes first, the blessings or the benefits? Does joy produce gladness, or does gladness produce joy? You can see these are consequential questions that we're asking here. Is grace because of mercy, or is mercy because of grace? And what about truth and beauty? Is beauty because of truth, or is truth because of beauty? And don't get me started on faith and hope. And how about kindness? And charity, am I charitable because I'm kind 
or am I kind, am I kind because I'm charitable? And to top it all off, as Tina Turner once said, what's love got to do with it? Well, today, thanks to the divinely inspired courage and insight of the Apostle Paul, writing in the throes of imprisonment 2,000 years ago, we're going to tackle this issue of poetic engineering right here, right now at Milford Bible Church head on. So fasten your seatbelts. And we're going to do that right after we spend some quality time with the one who is completely responsible for poetic engineering. Let's go to him. Good morning, Father. What a joy it is indeed to walk before you. What a thrill it is, Father, to be in your house this morning. What a privilege it is, Father, to gather together with brothers and sisters who are here to know you more dearly, to see you more clearly, and to follow you more nearly day by day. Father, as we open up your word today, as always, we pray that all that we say, all that we do, all of the thoughts that are evoked over this next little bit of time would all be pleasing and honorable and right in your sight. Because as we will be shortly reminded, you are beautiful beyond a description and you are too marvelous for words. And Father, we pray that after this time, we would be motivated on so many levels, motivated toward gratitude, motivated toward trusting and obeying, motivated toward loving you and displaying that love in the way in which we love each other. And most of all, Father, we pray that we would find joy and peace beyond understanding in the knowledge that we are, in fact, wonderfully and poetically engineered. We give you all the honor and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as you, if you've been noticing uh, before, d during the time of scripture reading, I've chosen to have the subject scripture read. The reason being is having now heard it, we can kind of dig right into it. And so that is what we're going to do. We're going to dig right into how Paul responds in writing to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. Beginning in verse 1. I'm going to read through uh, 1 through 3 again. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. I'm going to stop right there for just a minute because I'm going to suggest that in the very beginning, right here, we find out as Paul is talking, is writing to the Ephesians, and by extension to us, we find out that there is, in this, their case was, there was a time in their lives when they were truly endangered. There is danger written all over the beginning of, of these verses. And you were dead in trespasses and sins. I don't know about you, but the thought that I was dead in my trespasses and sins, that's a dangerous thing. That's a dangerous place to be. Brother or sister, if you still don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are in danger. 
There is a judgment coming. And if you stand before your creator and Jesus Christ is not your Lord and Savior, the consequences are heartbreaking for eternity. So Paul immediately gets our attention, pointing out that there was a danger here for these folks that he's writing to and to us by extension. In fact, Paul says a similar thing in Colossians 3, 7, in which there is this litany of, of things like sexual immorality and impurity and passion and evil desire and covetousness, which he says is idolatry. And in response to all of that, Paul says, in these you too once walked when you were living in them. So for today, this message is particularly aimed at those of us who are born-again believers for whom Christ is Lord and Savior. And our prayer is that if Christ is not yet your Lord and Savior, that this first part of the passage would get your attention to the danger that you're in. And perhaps you might find some motivation for the rest of what Paul will have to say. And it's interesting because not only is Paul concerned about this, Peter as well. In 1 Peter 4, 3, we read, For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Not a pretty picture. But in the Ephesians verse, verse 2 continues with the following assertion. It says that following the course of the world is actually following the prince of the power of of the air, the prince of the power of the air. And of course, I'm praying that everybody in here recognizes that that is Satan that is being talked about, the angel who thought he could rise above the Almighty and yet was brought low with a third of the angels who foolishly followed him. Now, I plan to spend a lot of time talking about spiritual warfare when we get to chapter 6 of Ephesians. So we're not going to say much more about Satan and the power of the air at this point. But Paul does conclude verse 2 by identifying Satan's influence as the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. The spirit at work in the sons of disobedience. We sang a song about trusting and obeying. And if I could make one more shameless plug, that's in my book as well. But anyway, disobedience. How do you think God really feels about disobedience? Now, I know intellectually, that we're saying, are you kidding me? God must not like disobedience at all. Well, <laughs> you'd be right. The challenge is sometimes, and myself included, we act like he's okay with it. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but I have a feeling that I'm probably not alone in that temptation, acting even though I know God hates my disobedience, acting sometimes like I forget that fact. Well, to help us remember, let's take a peek at a couple of passages from Hebrews 4. 4.6 4, says, Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, it being God's rest, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. 
And then the writer of Hebrews talks a little more about what that looks like. And then he completes the thought in verse 11 of Hebrews 4, saying that, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Our Creator does not want us to fall because of disobedience. Paul, again, in his uh, epistle to Titus, in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 16, says, They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. The they, of course, being the folks we were talking about just a few minutes ago. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. And then in that same epistle, chapter 3, verse 3, he says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Now, I know that none of you have ever experienced in your own hearts and selves any of that stuff, but I'm here to tell you that I probably did enough for all of us and, quite frankly, still tempted sometimes to do it again. And then, continuing in our Ephesian passage now with verse 3, Referring to the disobedient, Paul points out that we are among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. In other words, for those of us who are now born again, and understand how that happened, why that happened, and the value of that happening, there was a time when we were, in fact, in great danger. So let's consider the first part of verse 3 regarding the passions of the flesh and carrying out the desires that accrue from living in disobedience. Now, in Matthew 26, 41, and Mark 14, 38, Jesus is recorded as having said, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, and I bet most of you can fill in the blank, but the flesh is weak. And we know, brothers and sisters, that even when Christ has gotten a hold of our hearts and our eternity, the flesh is still weak. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that the spirit within me is greater than whoever it is that wants to get inside of my head and my heart. Our spirits are, are willing, but our flesh is so weak. Romans 7, 5 says it like this. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. Now that's some interesting phraseology there. Our, Paul is asserting that in the flesh, our sinful passions he says, aroused by the law. So I think, what does that mean? Is that like when Flip Wilson said, the devil made me do it, the, the, the law made me do it? Is that what Paul's saying here? I love how Matthew Henry makes this really so clear. Speaking on what Paul is meaning by aroused by the law, he says this. Keep in mind, we're reading kind of Victorian kind of English here, so we'll do our best. We being tamed by the fall, the law comes and directs us. 
but provides nothing to heal and help our lameness, and so makes us halt and stumble the more. And now here's the key. Understand this of the law, not as a rule, but as a covenant of works. In other words, what the apostle is saying, and Matthew Henry, I believe, is interpreting right on target, is because we still are stuck in dependence on the law for our salvation, for our standing before our creator, that is what will ultimately arouse the passions when we are still living in the flesh. I hope that makes sense. If not, see me after the service and we'll talk about it some more. Romans 8, verses 7 and 8. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Don't I know it? Romans 13, 13 and 14. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, just in case you have any question about what that means, it doesn't mean putting on Christ does not mean that we're going to find just the right size, shape, and color of the Son of God to fit into our life. That's not what putting on the Son of God is. And again, I say that, and I don't mean to make light of it, but the reality is for a lot of us, there may be times in our lives where that's where our Christianity strays to finding just that right sense of Jesus that's going to be enough to get me by and make me feel really good about it. That's not what putting on Christ is. Here's what it is. It's being able and willing to resist and overcome the desires of the flesh because those brothers and sisters will never, ever, ever come naturally. There is no way, my beloved brethren, that in our own flesh, out of our own heart, absent the Holy Spirit, we could even be truly hearing this in the first place. This underscores, I submit, the absolute necessity of embracing completely and celebrating endlessly what Paul is inspired to write in Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 6, in which we discover having been dead in our trespasses, we are now supernaturally enlivened. Beginning in verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Oh. It's amazing. So verse 4, God is rich in mercy, but the great love with which he loved us, there's a deep theological point being made here. And the point is, 
it's good to be the king's. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In other words, because of just how gracious and loving is this king to whom we belong, we are made alive, and not only just alive, alive together with Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.15, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Colossians 2.13, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. We just prayed that together just a few minutes ago. Forgive us our trespasses. And there's even a little caveat there as we forgive those who trespass against us. Brothers and sisters, the best reason in the world for us to be committed to forgiving our own sin as well as the sin that we perceive in others is because of just how forgiving God has been to us. You've heard me say it before, and I'll probably say it a hundred times more. I really am not able, honestly, to help you much with your sin because I got so much I have to deal with with mine, okay? The Bible talks about take the beam out of your own eye before you take the speck out of your brother's eye. Mine's a 15-story mansion, so. But I will say this also. If you're hurting and you need some pastoral love, I'm here for you. I'll find a way. I'll remove whatever is in my eye for the moment and, and do what I can do in the power of the Holy Spirit to, to minister to you. So in other words, by the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, in him alone... Not only are we rescued from our sin suicide, but also according to Ephesians 2, 6 again, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Are you kidding me? As awful as as I am when God finds me, not only does he forgive, not only does he guide and lead and direct throughout my life, he also raises me up to be with him to be seated with him in the heavenly places? You know, if we think that we are somehow any more deserving of God's grace than was the thief on the cross when Jesus said, truly, you'll be with me today in paradise, if we think we are any more deserving or if we think we are any less deserving, both extremes were fooling ourselves. We are in this blessed state that Paul is talking about because of the grace and mercy and love of our Creator. That's it. So I'm asking myself, how are we just kind of sitting here or standing here and maybe thinking, oh, that's very nice, or, or yeah, that's good news. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. How come this incredibly incomprehensible idea that we who deserve nothing but scorn, reproach, and death from our Creator are not only saved out of all that, by the scorn, reproach, and death laid on his son, but we also get to be raised up 
and seated with him in heaven. How do we stand still with that? How do, how do we sit still? Why aren't we so enraptured as was Horatio Spofford when out of the depths of despair at the loss of his children, he wrote, My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. How about right now, if we take a moment in the silence of our hearts, right where we are, and praise him, and thank him, and contemplate what we've heard so far. I'll give you a moment. So why did God do all of this wonderful beyond imagination stuff for us? I submit that his intent here is to enlighten us, to shed his light on our darkness and to leave no doubt whatsoever about just who is the way and the truth and the life. Lest there be even a moment, brothers and sisters, in which we do not find ourselves transfigured by his grace and mercy and love. Just as Paul will now assert in verses 7 through 9 of Ephesians 2 so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. His desire is to show us, open up our hearts and our minds to all that he is and all that he has. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. I want to read that one more time. Fabulous memory verse. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, brothers and sisters, I believe this is a point in the Bible having been translated from Greek into English and our reading it and understanding it in English. I think that this phraseology right here is as concise clear as crystal and contemporary as it was 2,000 years ago. You'll be happy to hear this. Because of that, I feel no need to expound on this verse and this passage any further. Try to control your excitement about that at this time. However, Paul saves the most beautiful truth of this passage for last, as he sets out exactly how and why we are enabled in Christ to let our light so shine in this dark world. And it's in verse 10 that we discover that it is all due to divine poetic engineering because this is what it says in verse 10. 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, when I first came to a place in my life when I was interested in some of the Greek words that led to the English words that we read in our Bible, that word workmanship was one of the uh, terms that I was interested in. And so I looked it up, and lo and behold, the word workmanship in this context is from a Greek word, word poema. P, uh, it, it's transliterated P-O-I-E-M-A, poema. And I said, poema? Hmm, sounds a lot like poem. So I went to my go-to Webster's 1828 dictionary to see if I could discover the etymology of the word poem, and this is what it said. Poem, from the Greek, poema, derived from a root verb meaning to make. Now, I went to a bunch of other sources for confirmation as well, and then being the postmodern technological scholar that I am, I went to an AI site to see what artificial intelligence had to say about the etymology of the word poem. And this is what artificial intelligence says. The word poem comes from the Greek word poema, which means a thing made. In ancient terms, a poet was defined as a maker of things. By now, as you might imagine, my head is swimming. This is too good to be true. 2 Timothy 4, 5 uses that same Greek as follows, that same Greek root as follows, poema. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Revelation 2, 5, Jesus says, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works of you did at first. So not only are we God's poem, we get to do poetic work because of him and in the strength and power of the Holy Spirit. So in a very real sense then, I'm going to submit that we are, each and every one of us, the product of divine poetic engineering. Now, if you do choose to read my book and you get to page eight and you're still awake, this is where you'll find that analysis, if you will, that we are, in fact, God's poem. So if we are, in fact, God's poem, and with apologies... To Joyce Kilmer, I offer the following observation in closing. I think that I shall never see a poem as loved as you and me, a poem whose hungry soul is blessed by sin forgiven when confessed, a poem that looks to God all day and lifts up holy hands to pray, a poem that even in despair can trust his soul to God's repair, within whose heart the Savior lives, eternal joy and life he gives. A poem is a blessed thing when engineered by Christ the King. Let's pray. Divine Poet, Creator, Redeemer, Father, Friend, beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words. Thank you for who you are. 
and whose we are because of Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Father, I would pray today that if there is still one within the sound of my voice who for reason I cannot begin to fathom still has not realized his or her need of a Savior, still does not fully comprehend the depth of their sin and the danger therein. Oh, Father, may this be the moment, may this be the day that such a one finally takes him or herself off of the throne of his or her life and places you upon it, or at least begins the process item by item of placing each aspect of that life to the side so that you may occupy that throne. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Father, for men like the Apostle Paul, who even in the, in the depths of despair and imprisonment himself, you empowered to write messages to his contemporaries who are just as relevant today and will be tomorrow as they were when first written and delivered. And so what else can we do, Father, but bow before you, humbly acknowledge all that we are not and all that you are. And go out with gratitude, displaying our love for you in the way in which we love each other. In Jesus' name, amen.